So as it was taught to me, Hono Kauai Valley, Hono is bay, ko refer to sugar, and wai or wai is fresh water. So our interpretation is a bay of sweet water. It was the agricultural food production area of Kekaa. Kekaa being a place we call Black Rock or where the Sheraton and Kanapali is right now. So it was the breadbasket to feed the many villages that exist along the coastline. That is Ikolo Lindsay, the president of Maui Culture Lands on Maui. I can't wait for you to hear more from him and about Maui Culture Lands and, and how you and your family can get involved during your next trip to Maui. Lots to talk about on this episode of Hawaii's Best. Let's go. Aloha. Welcome to Hawaii's Best, where we help prepare you for your visit to Hawaii. Here, you'll learn what to know before traveling as we discover Hawaiian culture, local businesses, and the experiences that make Hawaii one of the most incredible places in the world. Aloha and welcome to a new episode of Hawaii's Best. I'm your host, Brian Murphy, and it is good to be back. I've missed you guys. And I've been missing releasing these, and I know some of you have. You reached out to me or, or on our page at hawaii's.best on Instagram. And um, I just want to say thank you so much for the support. Over the last few months and probably the last couple of years, actually, a lot like you, I've had to pivot as well on my other stuff that I do. And, and uh, the other thing that I run is a podcast production company. I've had to kind of dive all in on that during the last couple of years when everyone was, uh, you know, locked in at home, starting podcasts, being able to to do that and help get other people's podcasts up and running, was, which was great. But I've realized over the last few months since we released an episode on Hawaii's Best that I've missed doing this. I've, I've missed connecting with locals on Hawaii and being able to connect with businesses, local businesses, and bringing some of those stories to you, some of those tips and those resources, and especially as we're staring down summer of 2022 is probably going to be, not probably, it's going to be a huge summer in Hawaii now that so many travel restrictions have been lifted. And a lot of that we're kind of transitioning out of. A lot of people are getting back to normal and traveling again. And a lot of people's top of the list is Hawaii. We've seen that over spring break. We saw that last summer. And what you're going to hear more from Ikolo Lindsay later on in this episode is a little bit of what last summer was in Hawaii. There was a lot of tension, honestly. There was a lot of tension from locals and from travelers. And you're going to hear some of that in the conversation it's all wrapped in aloha, I promise. And I hope that you're dreaming of traveling to Hawaii again. Maybe you have recently, or maybe you're thinking and dreaming of that next trip. And I hope that this can be a, a good resource for you, kind of dreaming and, and planning for the next trip. And before we dive in to the episode with Ikolu, I want to give you a few travel updates because some of you have reached out to us and um, asking about what the current travel restrictions are, what the travel updates are. And if you've been following the news at all, it's it's been pretty interesting. Hawaii safe travels restrictions ended about a month ago, almost to the day, on March 25th. So what that means is that travelers arriving after March 26, which is now, and beyond will no longer be required to complete a safe travels application to enter Hawaii. So, which is great news, meaning that there will be no COVID-related requirements for arriving for domestic travelers, passengers, travelers arriving in Hawaii directly from international airports must still comply with U.S. federal requirements. So definitely want to consult your particular airline if you are traveling international. Please take that into consideration. And also around last week, around this time, TSA announced that they lifted their mask mandate due to a court ruling in Florida. So what they said right from their site is that TSA will no longer enforce its security directives and emergency amendment requiring mask use on public transportation and transportation hubs. The CDC continues to recommend that people wear masks in indoor public transportation settings at this time. So that's totally your call. It's optional. Just take that into account as you're traveling. So that's good news. Basically, that's as 
close to back to normal than we've been in a couple of years. So traveling to Hawaii is definitely more doable. It's definitely more normal, if you will. However, there are some things as we're going to go on into this episode and find out that the influx of visitors has put a strain on the hospitality industry and the Department of Land and Natural Resources, which is a division of the state's park. And you may have heard, or maybe this is news to you, that there have been reservation rollouts for some of the popular locations, one on Oahu and one on Maui. Back on March 1st, Wainapana State Park now requires a reservation. So all visitors and local operators will need to make reservations to enter the popular Wainapana State Park beginning on March 1st. So obviously that's still in effect right now. If you're planning on going to Maui anytime soon, take that into consideration, especially if you're going to be doing the road to Hana where Wainapana is located, plan accordingly for that. Also just announced that they're going to be requiring reservations for Diamond Head, which is huge news. So as of May 12th, 2022, all out-of-state visitors must have an advance reservation to enter Diamond Head State Monument. The reservation system will activate on April 28th. So that's today of the release of this episode, April 28th, 2022, allowing for reservations to be made 14 days in advance. Hawaii residents continue to enjoy free access without reservations, but entry may depend on parking availability. So that is huge news. And to read up on more of the reservations at Wayanapana and Diamond Head, you can go to our show notes and get all those links and resources. And when I say show notes, maybe some of you are like, what are show notes? Basically show notes are just it's a blog post with links and resources mentioned in a podcast. You can simply go to the webpage of this episode, which is hawaiisbesttravel.com slash episode 70, or click the link within the description of your podcast player. All right, now let's move on to our listener review of the week. And it's been a minute since we've done this, and we've got a bunch of reviews over the last few months. And I I just want to read one of those, and I just want to say thank you so much for continuing to listen and subscribe and rate and do all that good stuff because it helps other people who love Hawaii just as much as you be able to find this podcast and hear stories from people like Ikola Lindsay and being able to plan for their trip. So this review comes from Rick6484 on Apple Podcasts, and the title of it says, The Best Podcast About Hawaii. There are a few other podcasts that are geared towards travelers, but all fall short compared to this one. One of the other podcasts is some travel agent promoting his booking services. Do people still use travel agents? The other podcasts consistently have audio issues and it's hard to get through More importantly, Hawaii's Best shares Hawaiian voices and how to travel responsibly, and the production is professional. Thanks for this awesome podcast. And I just want to say thank you so much for leaving that review. That means a lot. I don't know if people still use travel agents. I'd be curious. Maybe you do. But there's a lot of resources out there, and a lot of things that we talk about are some things to make sure you consider if you go through a travel agent or if you book on your own. There's going to be some experiences that definitely want you to consider, especially volunteering in Hawaii. I don't know if a lot of travel agents highlight that, but if they do, awesome. But definitely that's kind of lead into today's conversation with Ikolu Lindsay is about volunteering during your vacation, giving up an afternoon, a morning or whatever, giving back to Hawaii and some of the perspective on when this was recorded. So Ikolu and I, we sat down and did this podcast episode back in June or July of 2021. And during that time was when travel back into Hawaii had was just going crazy, meaning there's this tension, right? The tension of people in mainland US who have been cooped up and wanting to travel and maybe don't feel super comfortable about traveling internationally. Hawaii kind of jumped right to the top of the list for a lot of people. And as soon as that was a reality, a lot of people flocked to Hawaii. Hawaii honestly just wasn't ready, meaning there was a safe travels program in place. There was a lot of hoops to jump through through that. 
there was hotels weren't fully staffed yet and up and running and there was limited capacity for this venue and that venue and that, you know, favorite restaurant. So there was a lot of tension built up because people wanting to travel again, wanting to create those experiences and and memories again, but also a place that wasn't quite set up to be ready to receive that amount of visitors. And you're going to hear some of that tension in my conversation with Ikulu. And I feel now as we've kind of gone through that the last six months and we've seen where things are at now, it's definitely a better place. But some of the principles and some of the things that he talks about through this episode are some things to definitely consider and definitely be mindful of on your next trip to Hawaii and really wanted to get out there anywhere we travel, be it Greece or Japan or any other culture that you and I are traveling into to just be aware of that culture and just to do a little research and homework. And that's really what this podcast is about. And I, I thank you for tuning in and I can't wait for you to hear more about Maui culture lands. And like I mentioned in the intro, Ikolo Lindsay is a president of Maui culture lands and it's a nonprofit that was founded by his parents in 1999 to boost conservationist efforts on the island of Maui and specifically to bring continued restoration and protection to Honokawai Valley. Their mission includes telling the stories of the spaces they fight to preserve through education and healthy exploration. Honokawai Valley's name reflects its natural resources, sugarcane and water. It was a very rich agricultural area supplying not just sugar, but other foods for many of the surrounding communities. And you hear more about that in this conversation. There are buildings on the land that date back to 1200 AD. Currently, reforestation efforts and ecological preservation work are establishing sustainability in the area to ensure the important historic valley thrives for generations to come. Oh, and also the mayor of Maui County, Michael Victorino, declared back in 2019 that October 3rd to be Edwin Ikolu Lindsay Day across Maui County, which is pretty cool to have your own day. And that was to celebrate him and honor him and his parents for the hard work and the continued efforts in preserving Hawaii's natural resources. So without further ado, let's go ahead. Let's talk story with Ekolu Lindsay from Maui. Hey, Kolu, thank you so much for coming on Hawaii's Best. I appreciate you and your time. How are you doing today? I'm doing wonderful, man. And thank you for having me and giving us this opportunity to share what we do with Maui Cultural Lands and just share with the general public the opportunities that exist here in Maui. Absolutely. And as those who are listening, I gave a bio of who you are, Maui Cultural Land, a little bit, but love to hear just from your own breath. Just obviously you're on Maui who you are and bring us up today of where Maui culture lands is today. Okay. My name is Ekolu Lindsay. My father started Maui culture lands back in 1999. This was just after the sugar industry had closed down on West Maui. And so all the lands became ripe for development and being purchased by developers. So it became a mission of his and a few others to explore the many valleys that exist and found Honokwai Valley to be one of the most archeologically rich valleys. So the effort was made there to focus in on the cultural resources and the stories, the history of that space. The intent is to create the awareness for people. What's in their backyards? Why is it there? What story does it tell? And to be inclusive in this. And his grander vision was to include every single valley along with Somali, because as development moves along these stories and i hate to use the word story but lack of a better word it's not stories it's a recounting of fact these stories tend to get lost and it becomes just a space that people live in but the history of that space is super important describing the ecology of the area the cultural identity of the area what used to be and it's important to know the history of those spaces because without the history of the space we don't know who we are where we're going 
we rely on that so much. So the effort was made to preserve Honokoai Valley through education. My father is a retired teacher and he loved the outdoor classrooms. Yeah. And, you know, growing up, I was just always envious of him taking his students out on a double haul canoe or hiking Kealalo, the King's Trail and, and camping out or doing celestial navigation. They did all this really cool stuff, you know, that people can't really do too much anymore today. And that stays with you, right? Like that. Right. You taste it, you right. smell that you walk the same footsteps. Right. So, you know, he, he, he did that. And this was his outdoor classroom, basically, what it turned out to be. You talked a little bit about, obviously, when Sugar Mill came and that production, but what about the history? Because the, the valley has so much. The Honokawai Valley, and a lot of people get confused with Honokohau. Mm-hmm. It's Honokohau is out past Honolulu Bay. Notice the word Hono three times already, right? So Hono is Bay. So Honokawai, like any Hawaiian name, place name, it comes, the name itself holds the Mo'olelo or the history of that place. And it's also always open to interpretation based on who's telling that recounting of fact. So as it was taught to me, Honokawai Valley, Hono is bay, ko referred to sugar, and wai or wai is fresh water. So our interpretation is a bay of sweet water. It was the agricultural food production area of Keka'a. Keka'a being a place we call Black Rock or where the Sheraton and Kanapali is right now. So it was the bread basket to feed the many villages that exist along the coastline. It was estimated that 600 people kind of lived in that space, but it fit about 6,000 people. It was a very rich agricultural production area. As such, you have a lot of remnant structures that date back to around 1200 AD. And so most of it is low ikalo, but there's a heiau and other house house structures. It's very, very rich and it's, Pretty awesome to see it still intact. Mm -hmm. And my dad passed in 2009 and I didn't realize it's like, I'm the holly boy of the family. (laughs) I didn't realize (laughs) it was going to drop into my lap. You know, I'm I'm proud of that. I'm like the only one in the family born in California. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Because my my dad is in the military, my mom was going to school at the time. And so the Hollywood boy, anyway, dropped into my lap and I was quite surprised when I was told to take over. But when you're growing up in this environment, you learn a lot of different things. Even if you're not paying attention, it's ingrained in you. And I said, man, if I'm going to do this, let's just go for it and go all out. Just learn along the way. And essentially that's what's happened. You know, stay close to my mom, listen to her wealth of knowledge, grab that, did my research, talk to many people kept sharing it with the many visitors and guests that come. And next thing you know, I'm like 12 years down the line doing it longer than what my dad was doing. <laughs> I told my mom that a couple of years, I said, dad, mom, I've been doing this longer than dad has. Although my dad was doing it all his life as a teacher, but in Honokawai, you know, you put that into that time perspective, it was pretty incredible. So maybe some like, I guess, just super elementary questions. Why is it important to preserve this valley and talking about reforestation and native species versus invasive? Why is that all important? Why does that matter? Oh, cool. That's a great question, Brian. Why does it matter? And that's a good question, you know, because when I moved back home to Maui in 2001, I had a, my son was three at the time. So being a busy parent working, he spent his Saturdays with my dad up in the valley. And that's the same question that four-year-old asked him, Grandpa, why is this important? And he was taken aback by that question because the scientists, the geologists, the botanists, everyone who's come up never asked him that question, let alone try to phrase it into terms that a four-year-old can understand. So his answer, because that is who, what we are. Mm. That is who we are. That is what we are. Everything is held in that space of our history, our culture, and is the foundation of who we are as Hawaiians, as people. The archaeological sites, the stones, the plants, the botany portion of it. As my grandfather would say, 
The Hawaiian culture is a simple culture. It is based off of sticks and stones. Food, clothing, transportation, medicine. It's all held with what nature had to offer. So we utilize nature to the best of our ability and used it sustainably, something we aspire to uh, move into in today's world, right? So as simple as it sounds, it is super complex. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I have met people, fishermen, for instance, that look out at the ocean, they'll tell you what fish is spawning, what fish you can catch, the conditions of the ocean, the moon phase it's in, when it's time to plant, when it's time to harvest all in an instant mm. without even thinking because it's automatic for these guys. And we don't have them too much anymore. We're relying on apps. Right. We're relying on a moon calendar. But when you run into people who live it and look at it every day where it's so ingrained in them and it's an instantaneous decision that they make, uh, I'm just amazed. I mean, you no, know, I would aspire to that. But that that is a true cultural practitioner. Mm. Right now, we're still, most of us are still students, students of it. And I'm still a student, always learning. But when you can aspire to just make that instantaneous, complex decision in a moment, that is something that we should all aspire to. And that's because they are, uh, these practitioners are tuned in to what nature has to offer. Right. Right. That's huge. You mentioned Black Rock, and obviously there's large resorts there now. And I, I think about mm -hmm. where. Honokovai Valley is located. Is this a protected valley? Right. So it's not necessarily protected, but we are the stewards. Gotcha. We are allowed to be there. So we are the stewards of that space. And we have been there since 1999. We invite anybody who would like to participate in volunteering opportunities with us. You know, we take volunteers up every Saturday. We normally meet at nine o'clock and we finish just after lunch. We find uh, work for about 90 minutes, talk story for a little bit, enjoy each other's company, meet new people, learn new things, learn a little bit of culture, history, science, answer any questions. We're not just going to work people. Yeah. We want to share together because we also learn from our visitors what they're doing in their part of the world. My dad, what he had created in this was to share cultural values. The center of it all being aloha. Everyone's got their definition of what aloha is. And aloha like sticks and stones, is simple yet very complex. <laughs> and uh, if you got the time, I can go into this a little. Do it, do <laughs> it, yeah. Okay, so my dad, the big scheme of it all is, is I shouldn't say scheme, it's a wrong word. <laughs> what he wants to do was to share aloha with the world. Right? If we can share aloha with the world, perhaps we can have world peace. That was his high vision of things. Sure. So when I, I recently did a, a top story session uh, in a town hall meeting with county council about regenerative tourism, right? But, you know, what, what is regenerative tourism? We just came from the sustainable tourism, ecotourism, <laughs> biotourism, <laughs> agritourism. There's all these tourism right, things. Right. To me, I'm becoming very cynical about these efforts. Is regenerative tourism another way of allowing more tourists to come here? Mm. You know, it's just, you know, we're supposed to leave a, a lighter footprint. But when you're reaching 3 million visitors a year, how in the world can you leave a lighter footprint? You're using resources. You're, there's user conflict. There's nature conflict, right? right? So when I asked my aunt, my dad's older sister, she's the he, well, the, the elder of the family, what were five cultural values that I could share on a regenerative tourism talk? First thing she says to me is, Sekolu, these are not values. These are processes. Hmm. You need to learn the process before you can practice the value of that process. And right there, I'm like, whoa, a process? I've never heard of that. So I listen. And you know, when you listen to them, sometimes you just got one shot at it and you better pick things up <laughs> quickly. So the first process to learn is kupono. Kupono, honesty. Ku Referring to stand upright and stall tall. Also, pono, to stand in righteousness. So you need to stand upright and tall by speaking the truth. It's something that I don't even think anybody can practice this value properly yet mm. because we're holding stuff that. But there's a way to tell the truth that's not degrading. 
it has to be a way to build people on their shortcomings. So the first step is have to learn kupono. The second one you needed to learn was malama. Lama was the light, the generation, regeneration of life. To malama, to take care of, that's automatic. Take care of that life. You know, we use that term malama, aina, malama, you know, we malama many different things. Sure. So after kupono and malama, then we learn kokua. Okay. I've always understood kokua as uh, to help without any expectations of reciprocation because you want to. She just blew my mind when she told me what kokua was. Kua is the backbone, also short for akua or God. And the ko is the long whistle of eternity. Hmm. Oh, what? Whistle of eternity? I didn't even know eternity had a sound. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm listening intently at this point. Going, oh my God, this is like a process of understanding what kokua is. A long whistle of eternity with a strong backbone and even helping people that's automatic. After learning honesty and how to take care of the regeneration, generation of life. So if you put it in an algebraic equation, right? You have kupono plus malala plus kokua equals Aloha, love and compassion, right? So learning aloha, the process of aloha, encompasses learning these other processes, and then you can practice that, right? And that was just a short conversation of something that went on for a long time, right? And, you know, I didn't pick it all up, but I got the gist (laughs) of things. So when we say aloha, my father would also say it's, it's also misunderstood and misused. So we need to understand the true meaning of aloha. I do have another aunt that tells me, Ikolu, aloha was created by the visitors of Malahini so that we would accept them. Hmm. There's no such thing as aloha. We were a warring people. We fought amongst each other. We fought against our brothers, our fathers, our sisters. So that's another perspective, yeah. right? Yeah. But... um I think aloha, really love and compassion after learning these other processes is super important for all of us to understand as we're moving through a pandemic Mm -hmm. and um, watching our visitor counts go up. Let's jump into that a little bit. This time last year, almost exactly, I I think for some reason, August 8th is in my head or 13th, something like that around this time last year there was talks of like, it's slowly starting to reopen again after being closed for four, five months or so. And here we are sitting in, last I saw, it was it was higher than 2019 numbers. And yeah. any search on Google right now, you just type in Hawaii, you're going to get some interesting articles. One being the Delta variant is skyrocketing right now on all the islands. And also there's articles of what you already alluded to is where's this aloha with travelers and there's tension, especially it feels like the hotbed, if you will, is East Maui. Oh, well, you brought up a whole lot of points that we can talk for a long time on, but I'm going to try to keep Maybe there's a part two, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think so, man. So I'll keep it somewhat brief. Uh, let's, let's start with, Increase in visitor counts. Yeah, maybe the reopening and seeing, yeah. yeah. So reopening, you know, everyone was suffering, but government did step in and people were getting paid. And I think we created some lazy people out there <laughs> because no one wants to go back to work if I can get free money and not work so before I go back to work. <laughs> Why am I even work, right? Sure. But, you know, there's something to be said about an honest living, yeah. an honest wage, right. right? So I'm hoping people can jump back into work shortly because I've never heard of restaurants shutting down early. The lines are super long. Yeah. The, uh, it's just nuts. You know, uh, just driving down Front Street. I'm in Lahaina. Driving down Front Street is just so busy. We never expected tourists to come back this quickly during a pandemic, right? We're not prepared for it. We're just not. But, you know, that year that we had off, nature had a respite from people. We saw fish come back. We saw calves come back. We saw more people fishing and, and more families together. I think that had some time to strengthen that family nucleus as kids couldn't really go back to school. So the families needed to spend time together. And 
recreate themselves, you know, because, you know, I only hear the bad stories. Yeah. I hear, I know there are good, you got 10 good stories, one bad sure. story, you're going to hear the bad story, yeah, right? right? So I'm sure there's a lot of good stories out there, but I'm only hearing the, the, the not so good ones with uh, conflicts of people being disrespectful and entitled. I mean, if they shared with them a law, they would understand, you know, and I met some really nice visitors who come and visit with us, uh, work, volunteer with us as well. Sure. So I see the good side of that too, but I'm also seeing the frustration of local people and they learned over that pandemic, they gave up a lot mm. to be in the visitor industry. We finally got our spaces back. Now we got to share it again, right? I've never seen Kanapali Beach empty. And then as things opened up a little bit, it was all local people with their tents and coolers and kids and everything. It was really nice to see. And now that uh, the chairs and the tents are back up that are for the visitors, there's a little more conflict. We can share the space, but we need to do this respectfully. What does that mean? Respectfully. How do we respectfully share that space? Right now, we're just overcrowded. There's just too much. There's a capacity. There's only so many people you can fit into a room before the fire marshal shuts you down. <laughs> Maui isn't getting any bigger. And there's also people coming into Maui in particular who aren't aware of some of the culture. And you mentioned something about, about the reef and you had to get out there. Maybe a little bit of story on that and then a little bit of education of someone coming to the culture for the first time. Having gone out to East Maui several times, I work with some of the guys out there working on some conservation action plans and try to restore the ecology, and the marine life, and the terrestrial side as well. Just it's uh, you got to take care of that whole ahupua system. But having gone out there a few times over the last couple of months, there's just too many people on those roads. And working with like six different communities on East Maui, the number one thing that comes to the head all the time is people not knowing how to drive that road to ha East Maui. Everybody wants to take a look at the waterfalls, but you got cars parked on both sides of the roads. Big trucks can't get through. The locals are, are frustrated. They need to get to work. They need to get home. They can't get past. You had an emergency vehicle stuck because they can't get through. So uh, the county's put up some new parking signs and have some enforcement, but it's real difficult to enforce these things out on East Maui because they only have a police force of X amount sure. and you can't be there all the time, right? So I would like to ask anybody headed to uh, East Maui to just be very aware of their surroundings. Let the local cars pass by, pull over as soon as possible if they can, let them pass by. Don't block the roads. And also the one thing that pops up on East Maui is people are swimming a lot in these streams, right? And what do you do before you go swimming? You put sunscreen on. Okay, now Maui has uh, we have some new laws in place where you need to use reef-friendly sunscreen. But when you're putting on sunscreen and jumping into the streams, that water's going somewhere. Mm -hmm. So if you're around the Kenai area, that water is irrigating the taro that they have. So these guys in Kenai, they're seeing oil slicks come down and uh, watering the taro. What does that do to the food? It makes it taste funny. Sure. Right. So, you know, when, even when you go out in the sun, cover up a little bit. Right. So like even reef safe or non reef safe, does it regardless of whatever you're putting on your body is, is slicking off and getting into the, the taro fields. Yeah. yeah. With what, everything that's happening, you know, like this morning I was, uh, I had kayakers uh, on a tour that were stuck on the reef. What about those reef? It's just rocks. But it's not rocks. It's a live coral that you're stuck on, you know, and, and they don't know that. So I went out there to help them. Okay, come this way. This is how you walk on the coral. I got them off. They didn't, you know, um, they had a new guide for this company. So I, I, I try to educate the guides. But when you have a high turnover rate, there's a lot of education on my, on my half. But I'm willing to do whatever it takes to protect our reefs. What people don't realize is that these reefs protect not only property and people, but they house a lot of fish. It's a whole ecosystem that's established out there. And through the Hawaiian lens, you, utilizing the Kumulipo, which is our creation chant, line number 15 talks about the first form of life as the coral polyp. That makes corals the foundation of life. If we can't take care of those corals, what will life be like? You know, We won't see the degradation happen in our lifetime, but a couple of generations from now, you're definitely going to see those impacts. So it's super important that we take care of these, the coral because 
if the fish don't have any place to hide or have a house, they're open to predation by other predators. And eventually, we all aspire for food sustainability. But if we can't take care of those corals... Right. So, so you know, and, and we had a monk seal on the reef here too. And people don't know about monk seals, so they want to get up close. So a lot of social media, we saw people touching them. Some people think they're dead, so they want to push them back into the water when they're sleeping. So I was talking to my mom this morning, I'm like, whose fault is this mm. that the message is not getting out to the visitors about our cultural resources, the corals, the fish, the you know, dolphins, whales, any of turtles, all that. So I kind of came to the realization that it's, I think it's government's fault for not getting this message out on the airplanes. So that's done like a pre, like a pre-flight. Oh, hey. Yeah. Half an hour before landing, everyone's filling out cards before they get here. Right, right. Well, why not watch this mandatory video about how to enjoy Hawaii respectfully? Simple things go a long way. Hey, learn how to flash the shock appropriately when somebody lets you in a line when you're driving. Say thank you. You know, it does a lot. Yeah. So governments failed because the messaging is not on the airplanes. We failed because it's not at the airports. It's not at the rental car agencies. It's not at the hotels. So we're kind of on the this topic of solutions. If you have a magic wand or whatever, given all the circumstances that are current, what would you see would be an ideal future for Hawaii in regards to tourism? Tourism is our number one. It's our number one. That's where we get all the money from, right? Economically, tourism just ain't going away. People have talked about diversification. Mm -hmm. We've been talking about that for a long time. Diversifying to agriculture is going to take a long time to come back. That was one of the things to diversify or diversify into tech, technology sector. You know, that's kind of happening, but it's going to take a long time to happen. If I had that magic wand, really, I think the solution lies in limiting the amount of people that are coming. We have to limit the seats that are coming in, but we can't do it given our current government structure. Uh, I look at what Palau has done, a nation of Palau, a small nation. They are leaders in, in the marine pr- protections and programs that they've come up with. You know, they have this green fee that you pay 30 bucks when you get there and you pay again when you leave. And that all goes towards enforcement. And they're doing wonderful things. So small countries doing things that we cannot because we're just too big. We have too many laws, too many red tapes. So they have limited the amount of seats that are coming in. That way they can protect their natural resources. When they have tours, all the uh, people who are snorkeling are on floaties so they can't dive down and touch things, right? So prior to the economic explosion of tourism, Hawaii was a designation for a lifetime trip. You saved up. It was a special place. You dressed up in your best clothes. You took the air for your flight to, to Hawaii. Yeah. You got off, you got a lady, you went to your hotel and you had a wonderful time. It was a special place. Now mm-hmm. we're competing with other markets and things have changed substantially. How do we manage tourism properly? Right. I think it, 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 it sits in the, in the amount of seats. That's what one magic wand would do, limit the amount of people that would come. Now, whenever you visit someplace, you'd like to think, you know, the, or the cliche when in Rome, do it's Romans, right? Like in Hawaii, do it's the Hawaiians. Share the time, share the spirit, share the love, share the aloha. But you have to understand kupono malama kukua in order to figure out aloha, right? <laughs> Full circle, so, yeah. Right? So with Maui cultural lands, these are some of the things we share with our visitors. We share that through malama aina. We share that through honesty. We share that to having, holding ourselves to a level of integrity that makes people feel like, oh, this is super cool. I want to understand more. But more importantly, I think, when they take that aloha back with them, wherever they're from, they can share it in their own backyard, but also take a look at the resources that are being utilized in their space. How can they make that better? Mm. What was the indigenous culture that was there before them? I had a lady that asked me, cool, what does Hawaii mean? I was like, where are you from? Because I'm from Ohio. What's Ohio mean? Hmm. You know, <laughs> I never thought about that. Right. So when I, when I looked it up, a couple of websites, and you have to be mindful of, of what their resources are. It just said motherland. I'm like, well, that's not right. It's not motherland. So, you know, it can break it down. Ha, 
on your breath, right. the essence, your heart, right? The vibe, fresh water. I didn't get what that last part of you was. So when I finally found it, it was like a, a supreme being, mm-hmm. God, right? So as God breathed life into these waters, it was my interpretation of that. That's what Hawaii means. So what does Ohio, what does California mean? What was it called before then? What was New York's uh, rivers called? So those are all questions we try to pull out or share with people by sharing what Makawai is, where the water go, what happened to it, you know? What are these structures that are left here? How was it integral into society at that time? So the question can be looked at in their own space and time. I love that. And I think to kind of wrap up, we haven't touched on it, but you and I and my wife, Ali, when we are on Maui last and we got to go down in Honokawai Valley and that experience is something that I still reminisce on. And I love to hear a little bit about what people can expect if they, you know, choose to go and, and volunteer because we got to experience that. But just from my personal experience, you walk down and you're going to sweat a little bit and that's part of it, right? And you're going to work. But as you walk down into this valley and, and hearing, you know, story from you and, and your mom, there's just this awe and there's this reverence as you walk, you know, trek on this trail and in planting trees and removing some invasive plants there. You just felt a part of, of the land. Even we were only there for, you know, two hours or whatever, but I just felt this sense of like, of just like worth, like I'm, I'm making a, a difference. Like I'm, yeah, I'm hanging out at Kanapali and probably had some of the best Mai Tais or whatever. This right here was what Maui to me, I kind of get a little emotional about it because it was such an incredible experience for, for myself and Ali, but what can someone expect, you know, coming to volunteer? Maui Cultural Land's mission really is, um, to stabilize, protect, and restore Hawaiian cultural resources. That's our mission. Simple mission. Stabilize, protect, restore. Those uh, resources include, like I said earlier, the sticks, the stones, but let's put in the people as well, right? So they all have to work together. And when you enter any space, there's always protocol. Protocol is a pretty fancy word for uh, manners, good manners. So we always do protocol upon entering a sacred space. Sacred in this place means uh, super important to us. You know, anyone has their own sacred spaces. So my mom says she's the uh, protocol practitioner. So to hear her voice ring out in the valley, asking permission for all of us to enter and enter safely, sets the foundation for the rest of the day. So as we walk in, you are literally walking in the footsteps of your ancestors because that's the trail that was utilized to access the valley. And, you know, the work that we do there is simple work. It is hard at times, you know, it's why we only work for about 90 minutes. That seems to be most people's threshold. If people can fathom 90 minutes of work and suffering for a little bit, uh, <laughs> I ask people to suffer because it makes for a better story when they go home. <laughs> They're not really suffering too bad, you know, They're a little hot, a little itchy, a couple bug bites, that's yeah. about it. But what you get out of it is so much more. The wealth, the, the feeling of being fulfilled culturally in a culture that you have no knowledge of but have a glimpse into that is what fills you that's the lasting impression you leave but you know a lot of people come to hawaii for the the paradise the fun and sun the fun the sun the surf the hula uh you know you got to do all that too and when they're in the mai tais and when you're done with that come and visit us so we can really show you what uh, a glimpse into the past is like. Mm-hmm. So, you know, removing those invasive species along that riparian corridor, stabilizing the Hawaiian biocultural resources is an important part of maintaining the integrity of that vahipana or that storied space. Now, that was a whole lot of words and a lot of big <laughs> stuff. You're going to come. You're going to pull some weeds <laughs> and you're going to make it really nice. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but there is more meaning to that once you get in. The simple yeah. fact of getting those weeds out of the ground puts your, your mana, your energy into that space as well. And I think this is what people gravitate to. 
And then they learn about the culture history of that place, the science and everything else and the, and the recounting of facts that used to be. And the importance of medicinal plants. Why, what plant do we use for being itchy? What plants do we use for bug bites? You know, these things all are there for us to learn. It, the, people just have to seek it out and, and go get it, right? So our volunteer days are every Saturday. We start at nine o'clock and we finish just after lunch. Uh, it's always uh, helpful that people come dressed appropriately. Some people come in shorts and a t-shirt. That's fine. Just be prepared for a little more bites than normal. Yeah. I like to cover up or wear long pants and a long sleeve shirt. And uh, definitely hat, lots of water for yourselves. Anybody can come and work with us from a three, four-year-old, as long as they can understand the words of do not throw that rock. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. No problem. We love to have those kids working with us. And as long as you're physically able to walk down a trail, it takes like six minutes to get down there, but you got to walk back up. It might take 12. As long as you're a little physically able, we welcome anybody who wants to participate. And how can people get connected with you, find you guys? Check out our website, MauiCulturalLands.org. Emails come directly to me. I'll send you confirmation letters, uh, what to expect. A couple of links on YouTube to take a look at, to help identify, what uh, will help you understand where you're going to go, what you're going to do. And I should answer most of your questions that way. But in the end, just kind of go with the flow, have a little fun, figure it out as we go suffer a little it might get a little itchy but we got medicine for that stuff we got Hawaiian medicinal plants in the end share the aloha share the love and compassion for each other for the land the space you, you exist in but also like you know take that home and share mm-hmm. it with your families yeah the two goals i have when it, when visitors come with me any visitor i always have two goals sometimes three but i'll stick with two the goal first goal i have for everybody have fun gotta have fun if you're not having fun, that's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> and the second goal I have, learn one thing yeah. in the realm of culture, history, and science. If we can have fun and learn one thing, a successful day. You walk away smiling, feeling good, and your Mai Tai tastes good after that too. <laughs> Even sweeter, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One thing I love to just ask at the end of every episode is... If someone's traveling to the islands for the very first time, maybe just talking about, let's, let's talk about food. It always goes back to food. What is, what is a spot on Maui that you would recommend someone trying? Oh, well, let's just say they're all good. Try a lunch wagon, try a restaurant, you expand your horizons, try something you've never tried before. And if you didn't like it, try it again to make sure you didn't like it. <laughs> expand your your taste buds and you know don't be afraid to try different things like when people come with us sometimes we'll have a little bit of ulu for them that's breadfruit to try or we might have some taro for them to try or some poi to try you know try poi but eat it the way it's supposed to be eaten eat it with some raw fish some dried fish something salty because that poi tastes ono <laughs> when you eat it properly now if you just eat it by itself and it's the kind that's watered down it doesn't taste like very much but try the hawaiian cuisines the hawaiian foods so you get the taste for the palate that existed here i asked one person uh, uncle mac poi poi on molokai uncle mac what's your secret to long life you know i always kid with him he goes Olu, raw fish and poi <laughs> <laughs> like just hands down yeah. right there, hands down raw fish and poi that's the secret to long life you gotta eat that stuff but the simple answer is super complex because you gotta go catch the fish you gotta know what fish you want right. what tastes good how to cook it and all the other details with that fish not to mention cleaning cutting prepping and all that stuff well good Ikulu, I, I I truly appreciate you thank you all right. Well, Brian, thank you for the time, and I hope that this helps visitors to kind of check a few things out, learn some of the local customs, learn just basically respect when you come into Hawaii, treat it like your grandmother's house, you know, always ask permission to enter, leave it nicer uh, than when you got there. Even if it's not your trash, hey, pick it up, put it in a rubbish can and take it with you. I really appreciate people who can do that, you know, yeah. and that's not just for the tourists, it's for everybody to participate in. Simple, respectful things go a long way. Uh, share that aloha, share a smile, 
say thank you. Don't think I'm trying to get something out of you just because I smiled and said aloha to you, right? right? Um, and, and I get that, you know, going to other countries, sometimes there's a, a hard sale a lot of times, you know, so they want something. No, we don't want anything. We just want to share the aloha with you. And if people can break through these bubbles of, of me, my, and I, and use we and us and be encompassing of each other and sharing the honesty and the generation of life and helping each other, I think. We can create a better world for our grandchildren. You know, I do all this work, not for me, for my son and those who are not even here yet. And a lot of us do that, not for us, not the present for the future. Of course, we want to make the present better, but really the work is for the future. Right. So thank you, Brian, for having me. I appreciate the time you've given me and the opportunity to share some simple thoughts. Absolutely. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha, Brian. I just want to thank Ikolu again for his time. And if you're interested in volunteering at Maui Cultural Lands, go to MauiCultureLands.org and you can connect with Ikolu there and find out more information about when and, and how to volunteer. Typically every Saturday, they work on the land and you get to learn some of the culture values and history of that place. And like I mentioned briefly in the episode, my wife and I, we got to experience this. It was an incredible experience and I want that for all of you. So consider that if you're not planning on traveling to Maui, there's other resources out there to consider. One of them is travel to change.org. That's travel, the number two change.org. And you'll be able to find some resources over there too. But again, Thank you so much for making it this far into the episode. And if you have, I want to encourage you to leave a honest rating and review that just helps other people who love Hawaii and can't wait to give back to the islands as much as you. So until next time, friends, which is going to be tomorrow, if you're listening to this on Thursday, we're going to release another episode tomorrow on Friday, talking about May Day with our unofficial cultural practitioner, Kahanui Solitorio. So stay tuned for that. Subscribe, be well. And until then, aloha. Mahalo for listening to this episode of Hawaii's Best. If you are enjoying the podcast, please take a moment to leave a review on Apple and a rating on Spotify. To stay up to date on future episodes, please subscribe and visit us at Hawaii's besttravel.com. Until next time, ahui ho.